Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Michael. How are you today? Man, I'm so good. I'm so excited to be here with you, my friend. Well, I'm really excited to have you on the show because I've read a little bit about your backstory, but there's nothing like hearing it directly from the person's mouth. Um, so I'm just going to say to our listeners, you're in for a bit of a roller coaster. <laughs> so um, sit in tight. And I I'm really, yeah, looking forward to hearing the story in some way. I've got some kind of trepidation as well, because I think there's been some interesting things happening to you. But uh, I'm glad you're here with us and you're well. And um, yeah. Let's get going. I start with a very simple question, Michael, and that is, um, Michael, please share us your story. And how did you get to where you are today? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I always like to create context when I get into this and just remind people to please not compare their journey to my journey. We all are on our own journeys and mine is fucking crazy like some movie and it's weird when I tell it because sometimes people are like, that's so insane. I cannot comprehend. And I'm like, it's true. It's real. Everything I'm going to say uh, happened, but please don't compare because it's not going to help anybody. Uh, no. So I grew up in Indianapolis, Indiana in America. My, my mother was a drug addict and alcoholic. Um, in fact, when I was four years old, she actually cut off my right index finger. And people always say, well, you know, how can your mother do that? And I always like to remind hurt people hurt people. We have to remember that as devastating as it may be. And she married my stepfather when I was six. He was super abusive. You know, the kind of guy you pray is never your stepdad. He kicked the crap out of my brothers and I put me in the hospital multiple times. I mean, the, the greatest fear I had as a kid was when he came home. I mean, today I'm six foot four, 220 pounds, like I'm a linebacker size man. And my stepdad was the same size as me. So imagine a guy that big beating up a little kid who's six years old. Mm. And again, hurt people, hurt people. When I go look at their background, when I know what they come from, you know, I have a lot of compassion for them, even though I know that's a weird word to use. Because I go look at their parents and their grandparents and the generational trauma that impacts. And so I spent a lot of my childhood homeless and deeply in poverty. In fact, from eight to 12 years old, we lived with over 30 different families. And so I'm getting bounced around place to place to place. And at one point, I lived by myself in an abandoned house for about six weeks. And that's when my grandmother found out and she came and took me and she adopted me. Because my stepdad was an over-the-road trucker who had recently divorced my mom, who was on his own thing. My mom was in rehab. And here I am at 12 years old, literally living by myself, stealing food to survive, um, you know, going and taking showers at school. It was really weird, weird experience. And, you know, you would think to some extent my grandmother coming and adopting me would be a godsend. And it kind of was except I'm biracial, black and white, and she's an old racist ass white lady from a town in Tennessee you never heard of. And so not only did I have the trauma of that, but also, I mean, it was so real. We had a copy of Hitler's biography, Mein Kampf, on our kitchen table, right? My uncle's a member of the Aryan Brotherhood. We weren't allowed to have black people inside of our house. Like it was some crazy shit. So, you know, here I am at 12 years old, basically having an identity crisis and I just started getting high. So at 12 years old, I started using drugs. I started popping pills. I started drinking and smoking. And by 15 years old, I was kicked out of high school. And, you know, I was trying to figure out what to do with my life. I'm selling drugs. I'm running from the cops. I'm breaking in the house. We're hurting people. I'm getting shot at. Like it's some movie shit. It's crazy. Yeah. And and one day I get a call from one of the um, counselors at school and she's like, the dean wants to talk to you. <laughs> and Michael, I'm like, for what? Like, you already kicked me out of school. Like, what do we have to talk about? And my yeah. grandmother is like, you need to go. You need to have this conversation, figure out what they want. So I go and I'm sitting in the library and there's the counselor and this woman I've never met. And they're like, uh, we're going to allow you into this last chance program. 
This is the only opportunity you're ever going to get. We're going to teach you how to write resumes and get a job because obviously school's not for you. And I'm like, yeah, no shit. So <laughs> I take them, I take them on and I go into this last chance program. And at the same time, like I put a restraining order against my mother and I have posted this on the internet before. You can watch my grades go from straight F's to straight A's, right? Because I was mm -hmm. finally in this place of some peace, of some structure, of some normality. And eventually I don't graduate high school. And in fact, my business teacher fails me, irony of all ironies. And at that time, my grandmother had let my mother move back into our house because my mom actually got sober. I'd never known her to be sober in my entire life. She wow. got sober at 30 days in. It's not even a month. Next thing you know, she's drinking, popping pills, crashing her car right back. Like it, none of that stuff that she had done the work on it ever happened. Mm -hmm. What I understand now, I didn't understand then that she was back in her place of trauma, of her place of abuse. And she was massively triggered trying to cope in the way that addicts cope. And so what I had to do in that time frame, because I didn't know what else to do, which I still stand by today, is I told her, I will never talk to you again. And I will tell you this, it's the hardest decision that I've ever made in my life. And at 18 years old, I knew that if I didn't do that, there's no way in hell you and I are having this conversation right now. And so I'm sitting here trying to figure out life. I'm 18, I'm in summer school. And the summer school teacher comes up to me one day and he's like, dude, we are done with you. Here's your diploma. Get out. Don't even come to the rest of the classes. And so here I am. I'm like, oh my God, what is happening in my life? I'm working at some warehouse job. My friends told me I'm uninvited to all their parties. My girlfriend's embarrassed of me. Like I'm really in this chaotic moment in my life. And I'm in this warehouse job, I'm putting microchips and motherboards like this all day long, 12 hours a day, 15 minute breaks, four days a week. And I get fired <laughs> probably because I was stoned, <laughs> but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sitting in. What is the solution for poverty? What is the solution for homelessness? What is the solution for all this abuse that I've been through? And Michael, my thought was, it's got to be money, right? It's got to be money. Because like, what else would it be? And so I made a decision. I said, by the time I'm 21, I want to make $100,000 a year legally. And that was super important to me because I have family in prison for life. I've been in handcuffs more times than I can count. And my three childhood best friends have been murdered. Yeah. So I knew what was going to happen if I didn't change my life. So I just took all those skills I learned in that last chance program and I got a job at a fast food place and I got 52 employees under me at 18 years old doing a million dollars in burgers and fries. It was crazy. Everything I know about leadership, I learned there. Mm. But it wasn't the solution. It wasn't the hundred grand a year. It was exhausting and it was mentally draining and it was thankless. And so I thought it about like, okay, what do I have to do? And I, I realized that I needed to get a job at an actual like corporation, wear a suit and tie in the briefcase and the whole nine, right? And so for the next year and a half, I got told no like 200 freaking times that I wasn't qualified, that I didn't have the experience, blah, blah, blah. And yeah. then I landed a job with a Fortune 10 company, one of the biggest companies in all of America. No high school diploma, no college education. And the year I was 21, I almost hit my goal. I was this close. I made $96,800. Yeah. <laughs> and in that, one of the things that happened is I learned that I could do whatever I wanted in my life. But yeah. part of the problem was I was not healed. I had not done any of the work. So the clarity I had about what I wanted was sex, drugs, rock and roll, fast cars, expensive clothes. And so for the next five years, I work at this company. I make almost a million fucking dollars, except I'm 50 grand in debt. I'm yeah. 350 pounds. I'm smoking two packs of cigarettes a day, drinking myself to sleep. I'm waking up and getting high just to function. My brothers told me, don't talk to me. My girlfriend left me. 
She found out I was cheating on her with like fucking 25 people. I like everything was a disaster. Yeah. And I hit I hit this rock bottom moment where one Saturday morning I'm laying in bed. Now, keep in mind I'm 350 pounds. I'm smoking a joint eating chocolate cake and watching the CrossFit games, man. And I was, <laughs> I was just like, what the fuck is going on? Mm. And for whatever reason, I, I picked myself up. I went and I looked at myself in the bathroom mirror. And I remember being eight years old and the water company had come and turned our water off. Mm. Right. But yeah. they were always turning off our water, our heat, our electricity. And so it was just another Tuesday to me. But for whatever reason, I went in the backyard, I grabbed this little blue bucket, I walked across the street to our neighbor's house, and for the first time, I stole water. And I remember being like, when I'm a grown-up, this won't be my life. And it wasn't in a lot of ways, but in so many ways it was, because I was still that hurt, lost little boy. Yes. And as I looked in that mirror, I realized the truth. I was breaking the promise I had made to myself. And so I said, as I looked in the mirror, what are you willing to do to have the life that you want to have? And the answer was no excuses, just results. And that meant no more playing the victim, no more letting myself off the hook, no more pretending to be someone else. Yeah. And 12 years later, man, here I am talking to you. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, I know the way you tell the story, it's well rehearsed. You have shared this story many, many times. And because you've gone through it so quick, it's almost it hasn't touched me yet. <laughs> you know, <laughs> do you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. The, the things that you mentioned are just so incredible that you almost need to listen to it again and pause it and just kind of absorb it. And the suffering and the hurt that you've experienced as a young boy, then also into adulthood and, you know, had to work through that is not, not an easy thing to do. I mean, what you went through, you would have expected that probably you would have ended up in jail or dead, one of those two things. Um, and I know uh, from, you know, the 160 people I've interviewed that we all go through suffering of some kind in our lives. Eventually, we will um, experience something. It could be very mild, but it might be very big to the individual because they've not experienced suffering. So reflecting back i know you said right 12 years later here i am and we'll we'll get into what you're doing today but what what i'm really curious about is do you today do you think i mean not a case of think or do you experience any flashbacks of these horrible times that you went through and you know get chills or not chills but sweats <laughs> about you know going back into that place of suffering momentarily i mean where are you at right now in terms of your your mental status about it all yeah that's a great question um so the the physiological response is not what it used to be because i've learned so many tools and coping mechanisms and actual practical things that i can do to really forego a lot of what that can look like. Um, I mean, there was a period of time where I was having five panic attacks a day, like right. dude, crippling on the fucking ground, having a heart attack, dying, call 911 kind of panic attacks. And in the last, I uh, call it eight years, I've only had one that that happened. And mm. the thing is that, you know, yeah, of course, man, I, I'm impacted by it. We're the we're the sum total of all of our experiences leading up to this moment. And so to pretend that that stuff just goes away because you go to therapy or you get a coach or you read a book is nonsense. Yes. Right? It's in our blood. It's in our DNA. It's in our history. It's in everything. 
And so, you know, one of the things that helped me tremendously that I cannot put enough emphasis on is I left Indiana. I left the place where all of this happened. Yes. And it was such an important role in my healing journey where now almost, I think it was eight years ago, seven and a half, eight years ago, somewhere in that window, I packed up everything that I owned and I left because I knew that if I stayed there, I, it was just like, man, I walked down the street or I'd hear a sound or I'd drive by that place. And it was like, boom, yes. boom, 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 boom. And so a big part of healing, I think for people is you got to leave where the fuck you grew up. You got to get out of that place and go and seek and find yourself. And so it wasn't only just that, but it was traveling the world and sitting on the most beautiful beaches and, and monasteries and architecture and just like discovering who I was that really allowed me to get deeper into my body. And so, you know, and plus the tools, all the therapy, group therapy, men's group therapy, gestalt, EMDR, CBT, doing NLP, coaching, somatic work, body work. You, dude, you name it. I've done it. I've literally done it all. There's no modality I haven't tried from mm. plant medicine to fucking meditation. I've done it all. And so the thing is like when that stuff happens, when the triggers occur, I just have to remember to use what I know. Yes, and yes. and that helps tremendously. So the thing about the sweats and the chills and the breakdowns and the you know the cognitive dissonance and all of that stuff like that doesn't exist for me anymore. I'm not saying it couldn't or it might not. I mean, shit, no. dude, there might be something buried that I still haven't discovered yet that just changes the game. I doubt it, but I mean, it could happen. And so I think the the most important thing is just leveraging the tools that I have. But what, what it sounds like, though, w w that whole list of things that you've read out that you've done, most definitely you have reconditioned your brain and your body probably, well, definitely, to be able to cope with anything that might come your way, right? So that that I'm not saying that, you know, none of us aren't affected by anything. And if something comes your way, you will be affected by it. But you be, you have a coping mechanism, you have a, you have a not it's not resistance, but it's a co not coping resilience. That's it. Yeah. You've you've built up a resilience in your conditioning of all the work that you've done, and I think that's an important point to get out because it doesn't matter how much suffering we have gone through or are going through, there is always hope that we can stop the the cycle. Of suffering because you know you when you mentioned some of the things that were very much like cycles you only you came out of it you went back into it again and eventually you've broken that cycle through all of that work that you've done on yourself so well done yeah thanks and i mean it is conditioning i mean your brain like i had to brainwash myself right you know you are growing up in in that kind of an environment and look again context like everybody's childhood is different. A singular small thing in passing that no one would ever think can impact people so negatively that it keeps them stuck forever, right? Yes. And then you have these gigantic things that happen as well that have the same result. And, and I think it's, it, you're right, it's resiliency, but it's more than that, man. Look, and this is what I try to teach my clients is you've got to take fucking action, like you mm. have got to do something about this because when I go look at my life 13 years ago, I was living exactly what everybody told me I was going to be. I was uneducated. I was ignorant. I was overweight. I was using drugs and women and just totally in this dissociated state. And that was because I had not realized one of the most important and empirical truths of life that you're actually in control. Like we live in the fucking matrix, man. Now, mm. Michael, do I mean that literally? Maybe. How would you know? Right. And so the thing, that, yeah. the thing that I always think about is you have this ability to control the narrative. You have the ability to control everything that happens in your life. Dude, I have done stuff where it is like when the moment occurs that I'm doing the thing, it's almost like deja vu because I've already played it through in my head 10,000 times. Yeah. And because of that, the thing that starts to occur is you notice that you can go to the next level, next level, next level. And sometimes that next level for me, like if I go rewind, you know, 26 to 30 years old was really, really, really hard for me because it was like, now I was cognizant 
of the decisions yes. that I was making. That's and right. so it was like one step forward, 10,000 steps backwards. And I would have these moments where I was like, fuck, man, I did the thing I'd said I'd never do again. And then I realized one of the really important things about life is it's recognizing that you're probably going to fuck up again, but can you create a bigger gap of time between those fuck ups, right? And that's really what it becomes is like leveraging the experience of life, building confidence, right? The number one thing that people don't have when they come into coaching with me is confidence, right? Yeah. You don't believe in yourself. They feel unlovable, unworthy, like they don't matter in the world. I get it. And the only way that you build confidence and you build self-assurance and that you build resilience is you have to force yourself to do the thing you know you need to do. Bro, it's so crazy to me that sometimes like I'll be coaching people and, and I'll be like, what do you need help with? And they'll be like, I don't know. And I'm like, yes, you do. So stop being scared and tell me. And then we will figure out how to do it because we all know inherently we, because we have this brain that is built for making meaning. And so what I started to do in my personal life, I just started making meaning. If I feel this way, why, if I do this, why, if this is the thing that happens, why, and trying to understand that causation and correlation, because there's, there's always a reason, you know, one of the things that, that I try to really, really remember is that our language and our words matter probably more than almost anything else. And yes. I used to be the guy when my friends were like, you're an asshole. And my brother's like, don't talk to me because you're selfish. And my girlfriend's like, you're emotionally closed down and I can't get close to you. I used to be like, that's just the way I am. <laughs> and, and dude, that is the most dangerous sentence known to man. Talk yeah. about the ultimate fixed mindset. And so when I realized that this is just the way I am is fucking stupid. Well, what I decided to do is start elaborating on the possibility of what if it was different? What if yeah. I did open up to my partner and share the fear of connectedness? What if I opened up to my brothers and I said, I'm sorry that I hurt you and I pushed you away because I didn't know how to be a human being because of the abuse, right? What if I had these conversations with my friends who was like, tell me why you think I'm an asshole, right? Because you yeah. might just be wrong, right? And But I mm. might be wrong too, or it's a miscommunication, or maybe we didn't have clarity about what it meant to be friends. And so the thing that I think people have to remember in this is like, you do have control and it boggles my mind that it takes these rock bottom moments for people to understand that, but I don't know how else people can understand it. And the yes. thing that's interesting is when people get to coaching with me, like, you know, we do the group coaching, we have the events, but when you get to like the one-on-one -on -one level with me, which is very small, cause I only take a couple of people at a time, like those people they're on the precipice of greatness, right? Yeah, yeah. But they've got to figure out why they're still stuck. And it all starts just asking yourself why. It really is like, why do I do this? Why do I act this way? Why do I let people hurt me? Why, 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 why? And not lying to yourself about it, right? Because I used to lie to myself about it. I'd be like, oh, because this is just who I am. No, motherfucker, you're this way because you had parents who didn't take care of you, who taught you that your opinion didn't matter, that you needed to subjugate yourself to pretending to be somebody else, because if you didn't, you would be in danger. And then you fell into the trap of thinking that community is about selling drugs and breaking into houses and hurting people. And you were uneducated and ignorant because you thought it was too cool to go to school. And so because of all those decisions, you end up chasing money. And because you chase money without clarity, your life became a disaster. <laughs> this is not rocket science it isn't no no it isn't but and people get themselves so into knots over it that they just cannot see a way out they've gone down this dead alley and gone i don't know the way out of here and sometimes because they can't look in the mirror and speak truth to themselves they need to have somebody like you speak truth to them and you are basically their mirror and go this is the truth now you've spoken to me for five minutes i know what the truth is this is the truth 
and you need to face up to it. And that's painful too, isn't it? I mean, facing up to your own truth can be very painful. And if you push through it, through it, it can be very rewarding too. Yeah. But I just want to show you something because we're on video talking to each other. And for the listeners, you won't be able to, the audio listeners won't be able to see this. And I didn't rehearse this, but you just said, why, 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 why? I'll just pull up my T-shirt and show you what it says. It's a bit broken apart, but it says why yeah. on my T-shirt. Right. And I have about five of these and these are the, and I wear these and people go, why do you have why? Because I agree with you. It's the most important question that we need to ask ourselves. Um, because people don't, you know, get clarity otherwise. <laughs> um, you mentioned about language and I 100% agree with you that there isn't just the language that we speak outwardly like that's just the way I am but it's also the internal language right so so do you have a view on that the kind of you know the voice in the head that keeps talking over and over and over and you know you're not worthy and all of that stuff yeah man you know it's the way I used to talk to myself was just the worst things I mean stuff that I won't even I have reprogrammed myself to the place in my life. I won't even use words like I used to use anymore because I feel a visceral emotional response when I use them, right? And so right. you have to think about tr the reality of it. Like we are our own worst enemies, but not natively, right? I know some people who are so full of confidence that the world looks at them as egomaniacs because mm. the world is scared to be confident. We're taught to be humble as kids, right? Oh, yes. don't, don't show off. Don't do this. Don't. And I'm like, why? Why not? Hum being humble is silly, man. Like not being able, it's so ignorant to me to not have the willingness to step into the truth that your ego is a huge part of who you are. Right. But the ego is very complex. It's very delicate. And so the thing that you have to do is to you have to know thyself. That is the yes. most important thing on planet. Know thyself, because when you know thyself, then you understand why you do the things that you do. Coming back to that word, why most hmm. people who grow up in traumatic backgrounds have the worst negative self-talk known to man. I'm one of them. That was my experience for 25, 26, 27 years. And what I realized was that that is the greatest lie we tell ourselves. The indoctrination of the belief that we are a certain way because of people who didn't take care of us, who were unhealed and believing that their truth is our truth is the greatest lie we tell ourselves. And look, man, I'll tell you this. Mindset is everything. And people in personal development and my world and self-help, they're always like mindset, 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 right? But they don't ever tell you what it actually is, right? Yeah. Mindset's very simple. What you think becomes what you speak. What you speak become your actions and your actions become your reality. And so if you're sitting here telling yourself, I'm not good enough, I'm not strong enough, I'm not capable enough, I'm a loser, I'm dumb, I'm fat, I'm stupid, I'm always gonna be alone, I'm always gonna be in debt, no one likes me, no one loves me, I'm gonna die by myself. That's gonna all be very true. Yeah. You've already predetermined that reality. And look, the truth is you can flip that narrative also. And what you have to understand is like some people listening to this right now are being so mean to themselves up here in their head, in the mm. silence, not even verbalizing it, but just in the silence of their own mind, they're being so mean to themselves. Like if you said some of that shit to me, I'm gonna punch you in the face, right? And you're expecting your life to be good. Yeah, There is a disconnect. And so one of the things I teach my clients that I wanna teach people right now, because if you pay attention to what I'm about to say, everything in your life will be different. I swear to you on everything that I know, everything will be different if you do this. You take a pen and a piece of paper and you write this down and you put it somewhere where you read it 4 million times a day. I am the kind of person who is kind to myself. I am the kind of person who is kind to myself. 
Why? Well, think about it. If mindset is what you think becomes what you speak, becomes your actions, become your reality, well, then aren't you tired of being an asshole to yourself? Yes. Wouldn't you much rather operate through kindness? And kind, let's be very clear, kindness isn't this thing where you're like, oh, I didn't do the thing I said I was going to do, and so I'm going to take a bubble bath and drink a glass of wine because life is so hard. That ain't kindness. <laughs> kind it's, dude, it's just not. <clears throat> kindness is you show up and you do it anyway. Kindness is you make sure that every single moment of every single day you live in your truth. You will operate in your boundaries. You show up, you take action, you move towards the thing you want to do, build, and create. You love yourself through, look, you love yourself through doing the difficult task. That's kindness. That's and it. What That's happens it. What happens is you start asking yourself in these moments of difficulty, of adversity, of when you want to quit, you ask yourself, what would a kind person do right now? Mm -hmm. Would they show up? Would they do it anyway? Would they push through? Not because they're tired or they need to rest. Again, know thyself. Just the other day, I did not work at all. I played video games all day. I needed a mental break. Right. But the next day I got up, it's five o'clock in the morning. We went back to work because kindness is about giving yourself what you need. It's effectively reparenting. Like really, if you really narrow it down, like building your life is reparenting yourself, holding yourself accountable, giving yourself the thing that you needed. But in order to do that effectively, it starts with that narrative that you have in your own damn head. People will look at the world and go, that's not possible. And I look at the world and I go, how did they do that? And yeah. that's the difference because yeah. the reality is, man, if anyone has ever done it, you can do it. That's it. That's yeah. the truth. But you have to be willing to do it. I wish I would. I wish this was my quote. I want to steal it so badly. Um, <laughs> Alex, there's a guy called Alex Hermosi, and I was listening to him on uh, Lewis Howell's podcast. And Alex said, most people take five years to do something that should take an hour. Hmm. And I think about that every day, man. People ask me all the time, like, how have you written so many books? How do you have so many stages that you've built? How many, how do you have this number one podcast? How do you, how do you, how do you, how do you? And I'm like, you take action. You just do it. Dude, the best time to deploy a parachute is when your ass is falling, not on the ground. Hmm. Figure it out as you go. Most people want the whole roadmap and the whole game plan because their narrative is tied to perfection. If it's yes. not perfect, then I can't do it because people are going to judge me. Bro, yes. people are judging you anyway. That's it. Well, Michael, do you, know, do you know how many people don't like me? No. I don't know because I don't care. <laughs> so guess what? You keep showing up every single day because it's your life. But the, the, the what, what you just said about the judging thing, it's not that people are afraid of being judged. That Because you're judging yourself all the time anyway, and if you're thinking that other people are watching you and judging you, they're too busy doing that themselves. Yeah. They haven't got time to judge you because they're thinking the same thoughts too about others. <laughs> yeah. People are always worried about what other people think. And I'm like, they're not thinking about you. No, no. <laughs> no. I, don't know, I don't know why your ego is so big that you believe that's it. that people are thinking yeah. about you. They're not, don't bro. Don't flatter yourself. They're not thinking about you. <laughs> they could care less. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Michael, thank you so much for all those amazing nuggets and, and things you're sharing. They're, they're really ringing true with me, and you speak such truth and such directness. And I love the little quote you said about, if you truly love yourself, you will do the difficult thing. I think that, that is even a better quote than that from compared to that other guys. That one is really the perfect, the perfect quote. If you love yourself, you will do the difficult thing. And uh, that's perfect. I've never heard that said in that way. And you say it better than I do. But thank you for that. I, I'd like to kind of get into you know, you've you've had this kind of journey in life. I'd, I'd like to know, how did it switch for you then, you know, helping other people? And then once you share that, please share with us how you're doing that today. 
You know, so here's what's really interesting. I, I realized at one point that life is actually about being of service. Mm. And when you stop making it about you, life gets better because I was super selfish, man. Like you can ask anybody who knew me 12 years ago. Like they were like, that dude is so selfish. He never does anything but think about himself. All he does is try to make sure his life's as great as it could be. And, and that was true because I didn't yeah. know how to not, it, it was hyper independence, man. I had to figure out how to live on my own as a child. And so that carried through. And, and what happened initially with Think Unbroken, like, man, I never planned on any of this. I, I never no. signed up to be the spokesperson for child abuse. And it kind of happened because I had been, I had a blog. I'm a writer first. Like ultimately at the end of the day, I'm a writer first. And so I was just writing stuff. And, and my writing style was like, I'm not going to edit it. I don't give a shit about grammar. I'm just hitting publish, right? And, yeah. and, you know, and I was just writing stuff and putting it out. And people were like, dude, I've never heard anybody say that before. Or that thing you wrote changed my life. And then it kind of turned into, hey, will you help me? And, and I was like, nah, I don't want to help you, man. Like, I don't know what I'm doing myself. <laughs> and then I, and then I realized, I was like, wait a second, the best way to learn and understand truly is by teaching. And so that's what I started doing. I just started teaching people what I learned. And so I was hosting workshops and events, and then it turned into the book and then it turned into the podcast and then it turned into conferences and then it turned into everything that it is today but it really only just simply started because I was like, man, what if I just was like what Gandhi said? What if I did become the change I wanted to see in the world and I stopped waiting for other people? And if you go rewind six years ago, man, nobody was talking about this. Nobody. No. Like, no. Like nobody. And so I was out here in a sea all by myself having yeah. this conversation. And, and it was really weird. And at first people were like shitting on me about it. And I was like, I don't care. This is, this is my truth. I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah. And, and the more that I share and the more that I do, the more that I find it supports and helps people in their journey. And so I just keep going, man. And, and the way that we do it now is still in the same guise. It's still about education. It's about teaching people and coaching people. The podcast, I mean, we put out over 500 episodes. I've been a guest like 400 times. We blog constantly, email newsletters constantly, free courses all the time. I've got a community of thousands of people. Like, uh, you know, we everything is free except for the stuff that's not, right? Mm. And so there's mm. just, there's a ton of information, a ton of education here because that's the cornerstone. Yeah. And, and is it aimed at like the child abuse or people's history when they were kids or how would you describe, you know, what, what is your audience comprised of? Yeah, dude, look, here's, what's really fascinating. So, and I don't share, no one ever asks me that question very, very rarely. And that's a good, great question. So my background is actually digital advertising, marketing, and branding. So I've worked mm. with some pretty big companies around the world over the last 15 years. And when I sat down to build out the avatar, who it is I believe my client was, when mm. I sat down to formulate the brand mission and values, when I put it all together, it was like, oh, I have this really clear idea about who this is. And then I started doing it. And then I realized that the research actually carried over into the brand because the research says statistically, and I disagree with it, 83% of people have an adverse childhood experience. The reason I disagree with it, one, the study is outdated. It's over 20 years old. Two, yeah. it was a small subset of people in California. Three, most of those people were not where I was from, where we grow up in households that say, if you tell anybody, we're going to beat the shit out of you. Yes. And so I would actually surmise that probably 95 to 97% of all people have had an adverse childhood experience. Mm. And so I had this really clear idea about what I thought it was. And dude, I've worked with people who are like 18 year olds, just finishing high school to people in their early twenties who are getting their first corporate job to executives for huge companies that we all have heard of to even, I had a woman who was a over the road truck driver, almost 70 years old. 
I've mm -hmm. worked with everybody, all races, all denominations, you know, 87 countries in the world consume our content. We have thousands of people registered for our conference. You know, it's one of those things where, man, as much as I wish I could be like, oh, it's just this subset of people, which it could be if I really wanted to niche down, but I yes. don't want to because I realized no, no. the truth over the last six years, this actually impacts people at a global scale. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. And in fact, you know, I know somebody who's kind of quite close to me and at an older age who is having to go through therapy. And guess what? The therapy is talking about his childhood experiences, you know, and so a lot can be, you know, found in that well of childhood experience. And it doesn't matter what age you are, you're still holding on to it for some reason. You haven't let it go. And yeah, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, you're doing some amazing, great work. And I just want to congratulate you and fantastic that you are, you know, doing this work globally and um, it's badly needed. So I hope you get you know, lots of visibility from this podcast and all the other 400 plus podcasts that you've been on. So, Michael, how how can people get hold of you, get hold of your courses, your book, your everything? Please share. Yeah, I mean, I'm on social everywhere at Michael Unbroken, but the best thing to do is come and join our community. It's Think Unbroken Academy. If you just go to thinkunbrokenacademy.com, um, there's tons of free resources in there. We're putting more in every single week. Um, yeah. And, and I think that the one thing people need to understand is like, you're not alone in this. And, yes. and, and that's the biggest thing. When, when you say you're alone, you're going to be alone. And for me, I built Think Unbroken Academy because I couldn't find the community I wanted. And so I said, right. I'm going to do it myself. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. And, and in the community, in the academy, do people go on a kind of learning journey on their own or how does it work? Yeah, I mean, it depends. I mean, we have free courses in there. We have different breakout groups. We have, you know, we host our conferences and events in there. Um, there's stuff about the podcast in there. There's paid courses, which are more in depth. And, you know, we have a six week course that's literally every single day you get coaching with us. Um, and then we have some other year long programs and stuff like that. So, you know, it really just depends. And this is what I tell people all the time, Michael, literally everything, dude, everything I teach is on the podcast for free. Yeah. Yeah. Listen to the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I get it. I get it. And when, when you say, you know, you get coaching every single day with this one particular Bay program, um, do you have a team of people that do the coaching? No, 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 you? it's all me. So we, we, I built a course out in through the app that's in the program where it's a drip program where every single day you get videos and tasks and questions and you're part of a group in that program. Right, got it. Now, as we grow, one of the things that we will do in the future um, I mean, this is a few years away now. I don't think the brand's big enough to take this on. Um, but we will have people who are certified Think Unbroken coaches. Got you. Yeah. So that, that's three to five years away, though. Yeah. And those might be people that have gone through your coaching program, right? That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. Because they will be the best people with their experience and their healing and their journey of recovery will exactly. be the best people potentially to do that. Great. Michael, is there anything else that you would have wanted to share that I didn't ask to get you to share? <laughs> no, man, I, I think that this was a, a phenomenal conversation. And I my hope is that people will not look at this as a, oh, man, that's so much. I don't think I can do it. And instead look at it and go, if he can do it, I can do it, too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just a kid from the hood who was homeless, who has no education. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great. And you're a great living example. And even though I wish those things never happened to you, right? I, I say this and sometimes people don't get it and they get a little bit offended when I say it. But in some strange, weird way, it was a gift 
and you know you've turned that into a gift to the rest of the world and uh, so we appreciate you i really appreciate you coming on the podcast and uh, i look forward to discovering some of your content and sharing it with people that i'm connected to as well um thank you so much indeed yeah my pleasure my friend thank you if you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe, and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.